Hello everyone, it's Ivoma, your guide to Nigeria, and today I am sitting with Udochi. Hi. We're going to be talking about the importance of retaining your culture in the diaspora. All of this is coming up. Please make sure to like, comment below. Those are amazing ways to support our channel. Okay, so the reason I decided to talk to Udochi today is because she is the woman that I have seen like in the diaspora retaining the Igbo culture. Everything she's doing is <laughs> Igbo related. And I actually think it's actually very interesting. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about the importance of retaining your culture mm. um, in the diaspora. So right now we're in the States and my parents always put us in these Igbo meetings. Mm, so I yeah. think that's actually kind of why. That's part of like why I, I have think a issue. lot of Igbo kids in the diaspora are so proud of their Igbo-ness. We have a lot of meetings. Because we have a lot of meetings, a lot of representation. Like, we see our parents yeah. who are, like, people who were, grew up in, in, in Nigeria um, continue their culture here. Like, they, yeah. they find themselves and they create these meetings, create these groups, and, you know, many of them have, like, volunteer things that they, like, or charity work that they're doing in their villages and stuff like that. There's the Obo meeting, there's the NBC meeting, there's the, you know, uh, Amreba meeting. Yes. Like, all these things. And so you will find, they find themselves and they find ways to participate. Now, I can't And that really... makes you stronger as an individual. Because exactly. Because that time when you're confused, when you want to be these, these other cultures, cultures, because they're predominant, right? There was a time, or a little stint where... They took us to these Igbo classes when we were little, but it was a very short-lived, um, like the Igbo people in the neighborhood created this thing. Um, there was Igbo church that we would go to. Like for a period of time, we went to like this white or internet, um, like multi, what do you call it? Not a nominational. Non-denominational. Non yeah, church where it was like mixed races and stuff like that. And then somewhere along the line, we ended up starting to go to this Igbo church. I guess they started an Igbo church in, in DC and we would all go there. We would see our cousins there and everything like that, which was really nice. But um, after a while, it just, you know, you when you're growing up and you're coming of age, you, you really just want to be like everyone else. You want friends. Yeah. You want all these things. So uh, when I was 13, actually, my parents sent me back to Nigeria. For how many, for for how many three years? years. Whoa! Good years of coming. She's clapping. Like, Congratulations! <laughs> claps at that so people are like you did what like well i know you must have did something I, yeah well i didn't do anything bad oh your parents just decided they, they just they wanted to upon themselves experience the culture yeah oh, okay. i don't there was nothing we weren't like bad kids or anything like that where it were was, you sent when you got to nigeria um i was sent to the village <laughs> like i'm so serious like is that why you can speak Igbo so well um i think some of the things i picked up was from the village but i didn't really even go out a lot when i was in the village i wasn't even like really interacting with everybody else because it was just such a culture shock. Yeah, you went from Washington, D.C. I went from Washington, D.C. to, 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 to Obo. <laughs> so, what state is that in? In Emo States. Okay. It's like near Oware, but not anything. Like, even Oware is not, like, so advanced as far as the city is concerned. But it was, and imagine that in the 90s. I came there in 1997. Oh my God, I forgot the year Bro. that you went. <laughs> I was thinking about right now, and I was yes. like, "Wait a minute!" It was it was very years. different, and I know, and even now, like people keep telling me, like it's so different now. So, um, I went there in the nineties. We were in the village. Um, even the school we went to was kind of villagish, like it was in Isiquato, like which is in like Abia State. So that's also village. Oh, I'm from Abia State. You are from Abia yeah. State. Awesome. So like that's kind of like a, a rural area as well. So mm -hmm. like you know. If you go out of the school compound, like, it's village. So we were really in the middle of just, like, this is the real Africa. You know what I'm saying? So um, it was a culture shock for me completely. I can imagine. Did your parents tell you before they dropped you off? Or um, they, they... Well, they told me that I was going to Nigeria. My sisters had gone the previous year, so I knew where oh, I was going. I already knew. But I knew where I was going, but I didn't know where I was going. Like, I didn't know what was good at, what I was going to see, what I was going to encounter. I had no idea. Like, I got letters from my sisters about different things. Like, oh, there's turkeys running around or, like, whatever, whatever on the school compound. Wait, I had no letters? reference. Yeah, I got letters from my sisters. Physical sister. letters? Physical letters. Oh, yeah, this is the 90s. This was the 90s, my friend. <laughs> like, we got, we got, we did phone calls a couple of times, but mostly letters. Like, if my dad went back or somebody came back, they would send letters. So you remember back in those days when they had the little letters with the red and blue? Yes. <laughs> seen on the yes. side of them. It was like, yeah, it was, it was something else. So back in those days, so fast forward to college, 
I lived on a dorm with like international students, so people from all over the world, China, Japan, Korea, uh, well, those are all Asian countries, but like Bosnia, uh, India, Egypt, like all countries, yeah, over the world, Portugal, like everywhere. So when I lived on that dorm, I started like it was international dorm and I told my and I went to live on that dorm specifically. The school I went to was 70 percent white. And what school did you go to? Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. In New York yes. Mm-hmm. And the and it was predominantly white. And so when I went there, I'm meeting all these people. They still speak their languages. You know, the Asians still speak their languages. Even the Europeans speak all those different languages. The, you know, people from Brazil, people from all these different things. And I'm noticing a big pattern and a difference. Mm-hmm. And you kind of notice these little things that everybody has, like, that's, unique to their culture and makes them unique and special and I just loved learning everybody's culture but when people would ask me you know about Igbo culture like how do you say this in Igbo how do you do you know what do Igbo people do about this and I realized for the first time how little I knew about myself yeah and then I had a few people tease me like you're not really African you're from you're you are what do they say you are you, like the people told you you're not black people told people you you're told not me i'm that black but people told me i'm that nigeria people told me i'm that american yeah. <laughs> i was told i'm i was told i am not nigerian i'm nigerian by way of dc like there was, was that's like, what everyone tells me weird like explanations of me yeah and i knew that i really wanted to be you know you know, I, I knew that the coach, I, I knew that there was something wrong in the sense that number one, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. And on the, on the one hand, and I'm going to be honest, I think, especially as Americans, let me be honest. You guys have met Nigerians from UK. You meet Nigerians or Africans mm-hmm. from Europe. They're African. They're very African. Africans from the U.S. and Canada, especially are not African. Especially if you grow up in the U.S., like it's no, they're it's, very disconnected. And I and I really believe that it's because I think um, I the think, distance. I don't think it's the distance. I think in the U.K. They acknowledge it's a weird kind of political thing. I think in the U.K. they acknowledge their colonial past. They try their best to like you know, acknowledge and be like, acknowledge the fact that people are different and like acknowledge differences. U.S. has this weird culture of we all got to get on the same page. Like we all watch the same TV shows. And if you find out that if you go to another country, they'll tell you that, Mm -hmm. that we don't like our news is different. Our, like a lot of things about how we do things here is different. Yes. And so there's a lot of like, um, social pressure to kind of do things in the American way. Like, yeah. that's the best way. Mm-hmm. And so there is a kind of pressure when you're here to disconnect from other ideas of of who you are. Like, everyone kind of fits into some kind of stereotype here. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to explain it well, but, like... It's very interesting. Yeah. It's it's, it's a different... It, it's a theory, but it's... it's I think it's. I think it has something to do with that. So when these people who came from another country came in and saw me, they saw me as an American. And even though, no matter how much I would tell them, "Oh, I'm Igbo," I, I, you know, this and this, I was like, "No, ultimately, you know, I have to be honest with myself, even though I wasn't honest with myself for a very long time. That I, I am grown up in America, and what I know is America. Like any delusions that I, <laughs> that I understand Nigerian culture, um, was you know, something that... No, it is a delusion. That's why there is a disconnect between when the diaspora is talking and when um, Nigerians are talking. Yeah. Another way to connect back home is to send money home. So one of the remittance companies that makes it easy to connect back home to Nigeria is SendWave. SendWave is making it easier for you and your loved ones to send and receive money. And there's no better time than to send now. Through a new CBN initiative, recipients will receive five Naira, for every one USD sent. So for example, like if you send your mom or your grandma $100, they'll receive an extra 500 Naira. So speak to your bank for additional details. This happens immediately. So with SendWave, you can now send money to your loved ones um, at five different partnered banks. So with SendWave, you can send USD to either Access Bank, Fidelity Bank, Zenith, GT, and now First Bank. So with three options to send money and five different bank options, SunWave is making money transfer easier than ever. Make sure to use my promo code Ivorma to receive an additional $5 to your first send when you sign up. Remember, my promo code I-V-E-O-M-A to receive an additional $5 to your first send when you sign up. 
I know now, now that I moved back to Nigeria, I've realized I didn't know nothing about Nigeria. Didn't know, you already know anything until you know. I didn't know nothing <laughs> about Nigeria, like, at all. I didn't know nothing. And then I acknowledged that. So I feel like the diaspora, first step is... First step is you admitting. don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. So in diaspora, I feel like we all need, especially Americans, Americans and Canadians, mm -hmm. Americans and Canadians, we have an issue. We know less about our culture than other our brothers and sisters in the UK, uh, in Europe, yeah. you know, they really do. We're different. Mm -hmm. So we need to start acknowledging that we don't know anything. And once we open that, once we literally say, oh, we don't know anything, we go in with an open heart, then you can, ex you can absorb. I feel like I became Nigerian when I moved to Nigeria because now I can understand the brain, like the, the, what's going on and why somebody is doing a certain thing. Because before I genuinely didn't understand because all I was thinking about was my American brain, right? Yeah. Um, and how Americans do things is actually very different than how a Nigerian yeah, would do we'll things. Do it. So it's, yeah, I think one of the, one of the challenges with an, as an American who was trying to like, you know, if, when you first try, when you first try to plug into the Nigerian system as you an get American, pushed out we have no we have the tendency to want to like be like to think that the way we're doing things is the best you know like we really do like it's an american thing and i think even when white americans go to other countries they also like they they get this same flack too like why do you think you're the your, your way is the best way and so we try to we, whenever we get some information from um from nigerians we're like, no, it should be done this way because this is what we do. And, you know, so a lot of times, uh, and that's, I think that's why they push back. I think that's why they push that back. That is why we, they push because back. You we, can't go to a place telling people you need to do it yeah, like this, this because yeah. then you don't even understand, like, our common sense here is different because our, com our situations are different. Yeah. Common sense in another country is different because their things that are common to them are different than here. It's very strange. Yeah, it is. I had to learn that, but I was open to that when I moved back. I already knew I didn't know anything. And I was, like, very comfortable. When, when Nigerians would tell me I wasn't Nigerian, I'd be like, okay. Yeah, <laughs> just want, yeah you just kind of have to. Americana, okay. I'm like, yeah. yeah, I mean. But now it's getting to a point where I'm, I'm starting to understand the Nigerian culture. I'm starting to understand the Igbo culture. And you need to go to the source. You need a to. lot of us, I think Americans and Canadians, we don't actually spend that much at least Europe, I guess because the ticket is so much cheaper and you guys are so much closer, you guys go to um, African countries or Nigeria mm -hmm. so much more frequently, frequently than we do. We just, Americans in general, they don't go, they don't travel like you guys do. So there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. There's a more of a disconnect, I think, with us. Mm -hmm. And then now, even when I read certain things, I can tell if somebody's part of the diaspora or they're part of the yeah. Nigerian. Because I'm like, I get it. Like, so what you just said here, baby, it literally doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> I realized that the retention of culture is not like something that happens easily. It's something you have to work for. Um, I think Igbo people at this time are realizing that because now there is a pushback. So there was a time that um, everybody was saying Igbo language is actually going to die out because mm -hmm. so many Igbo people, when we leave Nigeria, there was a time that people thought speaking Igbo to your children was either one, low class, yeah. or two, they're like, well, it might be too confusing for them. While forgetting that while you're in Nigeria, the person, your parents actually knew three languages. They probably knew three they languages. Probably, yeah minimum there are people who know way more yeah so it's kind of like very strange so i can't you can't be too harsh on them because they were the first generation right yeah. they're the first generation to move outside the country in mass but there's something about ebos that we just did not teach our kids the language when they left Actually, versus other nigerians now the, what i've started to think like in the process of like learning my culture and learning ebo and learning ebo way of life like to like the deeper Igbo. I started realizing that Igbo is actually the language and the culture are intertwined. Yeah. Like the way you speak Igbo is the way you live Igbo because it was post Biafran war, at least our era when our parents were, yeah. were, 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 you know, coming to America is there was like, it was like post Biafran war era. So there was some stigma to Igbo um, at that time. So that's also a thing that I kind of, um, kind of like, think is was part of the influence and I didn't the third even think thing about that that's really smart yeah and the third thing is um just nowadays this is actually now the the narrative has turned into you know you need english to make money but that doesn't even make sense because yoruba people 
speak their language and English. They make the money, but they still go home and, 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 and you know, in her, you know, hold on to their culture. I've noticed Yoruba kids, like, they all speak, they all speak Yoruba. Most of them do. Even yeah. if their Yoruba is horrible. The fact they can still speak it to me is impressive. Yeah. So what steps are you taking to retain your culture? So for me, uh, retaining my culture looks like learning Igbo, getting very fluent, trying to get fluent in it. Um, I've spent a lot of time studying Igbo mm -hmm. um, alone. You know? Aren't you working on a dictionary? Yeah, not me specifically, but I'm working with, with partners in Igbo land who are creating an Igbo dictionary for, like we are creating an Igbo dictionary under um, under our brand. Mm -hmm. uh, the co-founder of my brand, Ikenga Nation, um, we're creating a dictionary that is has Igbo words with Igbo definitions. And I'm working intimately with that, with that project. So it gives me the opportunity also to learn and practice Igbo. So the Igbo word, Igbo definition, English word, English definitions, and you know, we're, that project is coming along, you know, mm -hmm. and also helping me to learn Igbo as well. Do you think the Igbo language is dying out? Well, I'll say this. Um, so, you know, everyone knows about the UNESCO, like, you know, paper that went out that said the Igbo language would be, will be dead by 2050 or something like that. I can't mm -hmm. remember what the exact st statistics were. And, you know, and it freaked everybody out. Like, wh how, why, what's going on? The thing is, it was brought up at every meeting and in, in across the world, world every yeah. Evo meeting. I don't care where yeah. you are, yeah. you're in Sweden or the U.S. It was brought up in every Evo meeting. Every Evo was like, what is this? You know what he's saying? saying about Who this? are you to tell us that? Yeah, yeah. But because of that, it did. we did shine a light on our own culture. And yeah. so Evo people... Um, elders started talking about it. I remember I saw the new, like still today Igbo people talk about it like yeah uh, about they feel sad that they didn't teach their children they, yeah, the they language. Yeah, kind of dropped and, the ball on that. Yeah, yeah, and so because of that, I um I I I, I, I actually that's actually the reason like I took up the mantle and was like okay I want to do all these different things that um using the Igbo language because of, first initially I. I started a, a class, an Igbo class with my brother called Express Igbo. And so we were teaching people in the diaspora Igbo. And so we were, I taught myself, uh, was teaching myself through that. Um, I learned, I took the class like three times and it helped me a lot with Igbo. But then when I wanted to move forward and do other things, um, first of all, I was like, now that, now that I know Igbo and now that the people, once the people come out of this class, what next for them? Like you're in a diaspora, you learned Igbo, what's the next step for you? And so part of that, I was tell I told myself that I wanted to create content and create things using Igbo or that, 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 you know, that provoked people to listen to and speak and read and write Igbo so that they themselves will, you know, really master it and like really make it part of their everyday life. And so I do that. And so um, I had somebody in Nigeria send me a bunch of, of books that were written in Igbo. Mm -hmm. I follow a lot of Igbo influencers or Igbo teachers on social media. I, you know, some people say you should watch Nollywood movies, but I've just never been a movie watcher. Like, I can't really see myself just sitting there, not learning anything, but just watching and then, like, learning Igbo from that. Like, I don't know. You can, though. Yeah, I know a lot of people who do. I don't know why it's just never been. It's I just not how you learn things. It's not how I learn things. So I kind of like, you know, find I, there's other things that I do. So I do follow the influencers and like if I'm responding to somebody on Twitter, you know, if I see somebody type like lately, the number of people who type in Igbo on social media, I, I feel like has skyrocketed. I can tell because um, YouTube tells me like the search terms that people are looking for and it's like um, Igbo, Pigeon English. Yeah, for real. People are wow. looking for Igbo. Yeah. So nowadays it's more like more than ever. And so... That's I can you can easily find an Igbo influencer who's typing in Igbo or you know and speaking Igbo or making videos in Igbo who are even in okay, the village I and didn't stuff know. like that. Yeah. So now I so now I do that a lot. That's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think in, anybody who is trying to do that, trying to learn Igbo through like through social media, it's like just or not even through social media in general. If you're trying to learn Igbo. If there's something that you like to do that it really doesn't matter what language you do it in, mm -hmm. you can literally just shift what you're doing to doing it in Igbo. So, like, if you want to learn to write Igbo, start an Igbo blog instead of an English blog. Just write it in Igbo so that you can, like, practice Igbo. I actually want to do that. Um, and then 
if you like to watch movies, watch an Igbo movie. Or if you like to, you know, just find one thing that you can do in Igbo daily. Um, me, I do a lot of things in Igbo daily, but, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we still didn't answer the question. Do you think Igbo is dying out? Oh. <laughs> um, I have two parts to that answer. Number one, they're like, according to statistics, there's like 40 million Igbos in Nigeria. So... I don't I don't think it's dead. It might be on life support. I don't know. <laughs> or dying, but it might be like there there are definitely real evidences that like people even in rural areas in Nigeria are not learning Igbo because they feel like they have to learn um I mean it's not just people in the diaspora. People in the diaspora is just like forget it. But there are people there are people in rural Nigeria who probably technically like 10, 50, 20 years ago would probably have learned, grew up speaking Igbo and knew only Igbo. Who now people now just, are, they don't, I've actually gone to people, I've met people who were born and raised in Igbo land and in Nigeria and they cannot speak Igbo. Exactly. And that's and happening more and more. They can't write Igbo and they're actually proud. So here's the thing about that. I, I don't, I don't, maybe it is tied to Biafra War. That's what happens, like, when you lose a war. Yeah. <laughs> when you lose yeah. a war, I think that's actually, I do. I think it's, it is, it may be tied to Biafra War. Now that you mentioned it, it started me thinking because we lost, and I think that has residual effects. Because yeah. had we had won, there's no way we would not be speaking and writing Evo. Like, I yeah. genuinely don't believe that would yeah. be the situation. So I think that it is tied to Biafra War. And I, th I, think, um, I think there's a connection. When I went to Awari and I went to the village and I went to the city of Awari, which were bomb, bomb experience, um, I was... I was more, I, initially when I first moved back to Nigeria, I was more surprised when I would meet Nigerians of any tribe who couldn't speak their language. I was, I was surprised, but now it no longer surprises me because mm -hmm. I feel like that's a class thing. They're doing that on purpose. Like there's a reason they can't speak their language. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then, um, then I started when I went to the East and then I started, I met a couple of people who couldn't speak Igbo and I'm like, where did you grow up? They're like, oh, I grew up in, I don't know, Emo state. Mm -hmm. Um, what? Like, it's like, wait, 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 you, you, you went to school here, bro? Yeah. Oh, I went to Imsu. And you don't speak your language? Yeah. And then on top of that, like, um, they would also tell me, like, weird stories of, like, how even in their school, they would have to eat, like, pounded yam with a fork and knife. I think it's residual effects of colonialism. Yeah. Us losing the, um, losing the war. I, I think it's, I didn't even, I never even thought of Biafra War as being a, a, a part of this, but I think it's all of that. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I don't. It's definitely not going to be by 2050. Definitely not. But I can see that unless something it was moving happens, in that direction. Yeah, but we stopped but, that. Yeah, but we stopped that. I think slowed we're pushing. It. Yeah, we slowed it down. I think there's a big community of people of Igbo people on the internet who are pushing against it. Who are literally like speak Igbo, and even when even those people who don't speak Igbo well, they're still trying to push in that direction. And there's a lot of things that are. It's like it's like. You know, even with two steps forward, there's still pushes. There's still forces in nature acting against that. Yeah. So the fact that the entire internet is written in English means that people are thinking in English a lot more. So it's really it, that even adds to the complexity of the issue because people who want to use the internet or interact with the business world or the technology world or whatever yeah, they speak English, but they so do other to. cultures all the. All Asian culture, like a lot of people, like that you went to school with, they spoke English. But you can find, in addition to yes, but even in China, like a lot of the internet can be translated or is translated to Chinese. Yes, so they don't really have to interact with English as often as we do. And even in Russia, I know Russians even have like Russian-based programming languages that people have created. Okay, so there are things that people in other cultures actively are do to make sure that people are continuously like mentally interfacing with their own language daily. And we don't have that as much, not only in Igbo land, but even in Africa as a whole. We often feel like the intellect and technology and science and all that kind of stuff is something that's reserved for like English, English, Western. Yeah, stuff it's like colonialism. That. It's very it's interesting. Kind of it is, yeah. Okay, so why is it important to teach uh, Igbo culture to young? people well first of all um yeah it's very important 
it's very important it's it's like the most I think that's the greatest thing we can do to slow and stop the, you know, the decline of Igbo language and the existence of Igbo language is to teach your kids Igbo. And so uh, that's why I started the brand, which means learning is sweet. Mm -hmm. It means learning is sweet in Igbo. And uh, there's this character puppet named Maziago that I, that I use to teach, that, to teach kids concepts in Igbo language. And, you know, we recently started adding English subtitles just so that people can be able to like translate between and be able to understand what it is and get an interest in the show so that they can kind of, you know, immerse themselves when they're ready. But children are like the future, like children, like each child, child is, is the next generation mm -hmm. of what your world is going to look like. So when you train a child to learn, in fact, that's something that the colonialists did to penetrate our communities back in the day was to train our children in the church and in to speak English and stuff like that. Um, and that was considered to be like a, elite for the children to go to these, these, it was elite. these communities, these boarding houses to learn English and to learn the Christianity That's what and I was to saying. learn all those things. I think it's literally residual of that. Like yeah. it's literally that when Igbo people and I meet them in their, in their own freaking homeland yeah. and they're telling me with pride, oh, I can't speak Igbo. Baby, that's not something to that's be proud of. That's not to be proud of. of. What you're doing is you're, you're acting, you're working against your culture. It's very so odd. You're working against your community actually. Like you're opening the door for like your people to be like really, you know, subjected to outside influences because first of all you did not come up with that language it's, it's someone oh. someone is really like there are custodians of that language and there are someone in, the, in britain or like you know and they're the ones that, they created the oxford dictionary they created the webster you know they created these dictionaries they created these these rules for how to use that language and so if they decide to change the rules tomorrow you are subject to them and the choices and, and the choices to that unless you create an english for for nigerians dictionary and then your country becomes yeah. the one that's the custodian of the way we speak english in this language in this nation but outside of that like politically speaking you become subject to those who from whom you kind of draw that from mm -hmm. and so that's one of the biggest reasons why i think it's important for us to preserve or at least create our own way of doing things now back to your question about children um yes i believe it's very important for you to teach your children uh, Igbo. I believe it's just it's just natural for people to want to create the their offspring to be a reflection of them, and we're custodians of these children. So if whatever you want the future to look like, it must first be imparted to your children. And you, as a parent or a or a teacher or any community leader, um, that child is pretty much subject to you for the first like eighteen years of their life. Then they go out there's a, there's a bible verse that says teach your child the ways of the lord and then he will like never when they stray from it. when they grow up they never stray from it and that's a fact like whatever you teach a child when they're young it kind of it's kind of hard for them to like move out of that so imagine if we have entire schools teaching children a particular way of thought and a particular way of life then you have entire communities growing and contributing to that way of thought and that way of life yeah. which is why i believe that like creating these communities that are invested in contributing to the Igbo language is the only way to reverse that decline like if you teach a lot of children about Igbo, you know, even if you do it alongside of English, but you teach them not only the the language but the history and the needs of the thing eventually they're going to out of just reflex decide that in their in their later years that what they want to do with the knowledge that they gain with the resources that they gain is patch the needs of this right now when we grew up in like western schools and stuff like that we learn the history we learn western history we learn english language and we learn about what the future we believe is for for that. Like we started learning about computers and stuff like that yeah, yeah. way before these things became big. And then some people in colleges started coming up with websites and stuff like that because they were already primed to think that way. Mm -hmm. And so they were already primed that, okay, this is the next thing or biotechnology. You hear that a lot. Next thing you know, you want to be a biotechnologist mm -hmm. or doctor. We need to do medical missions. Next thing you know, you're thinking, I want to do medical missions. So it's like whatever you put into that child's mind, they take it as their mantle and the relay race. And the next thing you know, that's what they're chasing. So 
Um, I think if we can get a community of, you know, children, young people who are learning these things, learning the history, learning the problems and learning the, the, and learning the tools, the language and everything else that's needed, that eventually they're like, they will decide on their own that they want to participate in doing more for this particular way of life. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I agree. We need to lead our kids, right? Mm -hmm. Let them know about Igbo culture and the importance of their culture and where they came from. And all African cultures, like, yeah. embrace embrace it. Embrace who you are and, and contribute to it. I think once Africans in general embrace who <laughs> and what they are, then actually Africa will move forward. It will. Because right now, they I think they... a lot of Africans in general are embarrassed or mm -hmm. they feel less than when, in fact, it's like, no, look, it's, it's literally done on purpose to make you feel that way. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel insecure so they can prey on that. So if we can just not be so insecure, we can believe in our culture and believe in our ways. Because a lot of Africans do believe that our culture is the reason for the the waste of all, all men, almost all of our natural resources, right? But it's actually not our culture. So it's absolutely not our culture. It's not our culture. So I think if we didn't started, do that, yeah. our culture was actually responsible for preserving that which is still there. Yeah, and I think this is very poor history. A lot of, and then you know, it's it's like it's very interesting. It's like a lot of poor history knowledge. It it's like a lot of things going on when I went to Nigeria. Yeah, like, I just I realized that. So um, anyway. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, if you ever want to move back to Nigeria, you can. Um, bye now. Bye.